My name is Jeff Schumacher. I'm the Vice President of Exhibits and Programs here at the Mob Museum. Uh, we are on the second floor of the museum, which is in a historic courthouse and post office in downtown Las Vegas. Uh, on the second floor, we have the courtroom, which is uh, really the most majestic part of the museum. You can see it's just a, it's a beautiful space. It was designed in 1933. That's when the museum, when the, I'm sorry, that's when the building opened. And, uh, you know, this courtroom was really considered to be really one of the most fabulous places in Las Vegas at that time. Over the years, a lot of really interesting trials occurred in this space. Uh, most famously, though, was the Senate Investigating Committee, the Kefauver Committee, which met in this space on November 15th, 1950. And if you, there are only a few still photos of that event, but what you can see from those photos is this judge's bench. It's the original judge's bench uh, from 1933. And this is the secretary's bench. These are original uh, furniture from, uh, from the courtroom. Now, later on, after the Kefauver hearings and the world you know, of Las Vegas started to change, some changes were made to the architecture in this space. So this room, this great courtroom was actually broken up into two different rooms. And so when the year 2000 came along and the United States government said, we no longer want this building, the city of Las Vegas said, we would very much like to have it. Um, and they took it for $1. And there were two conditions on, why, on which they took this building. One, uh, they needed to preserve it, historically preserve the building. And two, it needed to be used for some kind of cultural use. So the, ultimately the cultural use they determined was a museum, thus the Mob Museum. Uh, and in terms of historic preservation, one of the things they wanted to do was bring this courtroom back to the 1950s, to the time of, of when Estes Kefauver from Tennessee came here and investigated organized crime right here in this space. So the, the walls that had been put in, the dividers, all of the nonsense that had been added in the 60s and 70s was pulled out of here. Pictures and architectural renderings were studied to determine that in fact this, this, way, this is the way the courtroom looked originally. Here we are, we're just outside the historic courtroom at the Mob Museum, and the area right outside is called Open City. And this is the story of Las Vegas in the golden era, 1950s, 1960s, when the Las Vegas Strip became a world destination, and when the mob, you know, ran Las Vegas. So we have some great artifacts in this space, highlighting the Flamingo Hotel, for example, with Bugsy Siegel building the Flamingo, we have Mo Dalitz, and Mo Dalitz was in instrumental in building the Desert Inn Hotel. We have the Tropicana Hotel, and the mob had, had some role in almost all of these resorts. So we've got some, uh, some artifacts to, to help you put this all in place. Photographs of these iconic entertainers and the cultural vivacity of Las Vegas in the 50s is exemplified here. Uh, this whole area really focuses on Las Vegas and how it came to be a mob town and then how the mob was pushed out of Las Vegas eventually. All right, now that you've had a behind the scenes tour of the, the historic courtroom at the Mob Museum, stay where you are because Mobbed Up Live is coming up. Once you got power, a lot of power, you don't care about the money no more. All my life I was raised as a, you never become a, a rat. They, they will rat you out if you don't rat them out. You don't buy Mr. Spalacho drinks. He buys you drinks. He told me, he says, uh, I'm in Chicago. I'm in Chicago. My loyalty is there. If you owed their money, if you fooled around with their wives, uh, if you did those sorts of things, you got into a lot of trouble. You know, he was willing to kill. Gaming control chaos is what it was. The mob would have destroyed Las Vegas. The only question, not if, but when it would be destroyed. You make your own bet. Hello and welcome to Mobbed Up Live. For the next hour, give or take, we will be exploring the history of the mob in Las Vegas and taking you inside Mobbed Up, the Fight for Las Vegas, an 11-part podcast series from the Las Vegas Review Journal and the Mob Museum. 
I am the host of that podcast, Reed Redmond, and I'm joined by Bomb Museum Vice President of Exhibits and Programs, Jeff Schumacher. We are coming to you live from inside the Mob Museum. And Jeff, before we bring out our first guests of the evening, can you tell us a little bit about the room that we're sitting in? Absolutely. Um, so we're in the, in the courtroom on the second floor of the Mob Museum. Of course, the museum's located in a historic building. It was the first federal courthouse and post office in Las Vegas, opened in 1933. And this uh, courtroom has been restored to its original glory. And so this is really one of the centerpieces of the museum. And anyone who's watching this that's been to the museum knows that it is much more than just this yeah. one room. Uh, can you walk us through a couple exhibits that, that you find most fascinating or maybe visitors tend to find the most fascinating? Sure. So, you know, um, we have four floors of exhibits. So it's just a lot to see here. Um, you know, I could maybe mention a couple. Like one of our oldest exhibits is our St. Valentine's Day Massacre wall. We have the bricks from the wall against which the victims of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago in 1929 were shot dead. And those bricks were preserved and, and now we have them on display here on the third floor. Um, fast forward to the 21st century, now we have a brand new exhibit called Rise of the Cartels. And then that, that we focus on the, the rise of the international drug cartels in Colombia and Mexico and we have some great artifacts to accompany that as well. Tons to explore. I know every time I come here I find a whole bunch of new things. Um, so we're going to be taking some listener qu questions throughout the live stream. The first couple are for us, or the first question uh, came. Todd K. and Eric R. both had uh, more or less the same question. They wrote in to ask how the podcast Mobbed Up came about and how much time and effort went into it. And I want to say we were first kicking around the idea roughly a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we got into production about last fall and it launched this past May. So it was a good eight, nine month production and just a ton of, of work went into it from the Las Vegas Review Journal side, from the Mob Museum side. As for me, I started with the Las Vegas Review Journal right around a year ago, and I was looking at the history of the city. When you look at the history of Las Vegas, the thing that stands out is the mob, and yeah. you know, the city wouldn't look the way it does today if not for the involvement of organized crime. And I quickly realized that, that nobody had ever done a podcast specifically about right. the mob in Las Vegas, and so I just said, you know, let's, let's find a way to tell that story. That's when we reached out to you all here at the Mob Museum, uh, and, and we're able to work out a partnership from the museum standpoint, why were you all excited to, to get involved in a project like this? Well, I'll tell you, the, the podcast format is so great for telling this kind of a story because you can get into great depth by interviewing subjects. Uh, you know, there's people who are still, uh, you know, as we'll see tonight, there's people who are, are very much alive who remember that era in Las Vegas and have tremendous stories to tell. And uh, in, in the podcast format, just feels right for talking about these sort of uh, both nostalgic and, and poignant stories about that time in Las Vegas. Absolutely. So we're going to bring out our first guest that you mentioned in just a second. But first, we're going to deal with this guy here. Uh, <laughs> we are going to do a couple trivia questions throughout the live stream and give away prize baskets. I see some mobbed up branded cards in there, some mob museum hand sanitizer from the distillery here. Tons of good stuff in there. Uh, and before we do that, got to give a quick summary of the rules, which can be read in their entirety at reviewjournal.com slash rules. Some light reading before bed. Uh, to participate, you must be 18 or older. For a chance to win, you'll have to type the correct answer to this trivia question in the comments on the Facebook live stream. Winners will be selected at random from those who timely submitted correct answers. If no one gets it correct, there won't be a winner for that prize. We will reveal our winners at the very end of the show, so you'll have to stick around. And if you're one of those winners, our team will be reaching out by direct message on Facebook during the live stream. Got to respond within five minutes, or we'll have to choose an alternate winner. Again, all the rules at reviewjournal.com slash rules. Okay. Trivia question number one is, before the show, we posted a separate video that gave you some history on the courtroom that we're currently sitting in. Where else in the Mom Museum did we take you on that tour? Your options are A, the distillery, B, the crime lab, C, the open city exhibit, or D, the speakeasy. Again, that's A, the distillery, B, the crime lab, C, open city, or D, the speakeasy. And as I mentioned, we will announce our winners at the end of the live stream. Throw your answers in the comments and stay tuned. And before we bring out our first panelists, 
We're going to roll a clip from the podcast for anyone out there who hasn't listened to it yet. Uh, all 11 parts of the podcast are available at reviewjournal.com slash mobbed up. One of the central stories that we tell in that podcast is the story of Frank Collada, who was a former mob associate, who was a part of this burglary crew in Las Vegas known as the Hole in the Wall Gang. And in this clip, here he is recalling one of his initial conversations with reputed mob enforcer Tony Splatro about forming that Hole in the Wall Gang. We'll roll that clip. So I get out of the car and Tony, Herbie Blitzstein's standing there. I know Herbie. So he tells Herbie, stay over to Herbie. So we go on the side and he tells me, he's talking, we're talking with our hands like this. He says, I'm glad you came. I said, well, Joe more or less ordered me. I said, but I'm here now, Tony. What do we? What, what do you need? What do you need me to do? He says, I need you to watch my back. Watch, make sure you, you're able to take care of people that come out of from Chicago or our friends in the casinos. Get them jobs, get them cops. They're going to know who you are in all these casinos. Even before you walk in the door, they're going to know that you're with me. I thought, how the f*** are they going to know that? He says, that's what I'm thinking of. He says, I need you to get some guys. He's like I said, I got guys with me, but I want our guys from Chicago. I said, all right, Tony, but they got to earn. These guys got to earn. I'll get you guys. They ain't going to work for nothing. And we don't give paychecks out. He said, tell them they could steal. Do anything they want. If I want them to whack somebody, I'll give them the okay on that. I'll get the okay from Chicago. Ah, it's okay. So that's when I formed a crew of guys. So you just heard from Frank Collada. We have brought up a couple of people who have had plenty of first-hand encounters with Frank Collada, with the Hole in the Wall gang, with organized crime in Las Vegas. Jeff, do you want to introduce our first panelist? Absolutely. Uh, so our first panelist is, is Stan Hunterton, uh, who served as a special attorney for the U.S. Justice Department's organized crime and racketeering section in Detroit, and then later with the organized crime strike force in Las Vegas in the 1980s. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, in short, uh, he was in the thick of the action here for several years. So thank you for joining us, Stan. Thank you. And our next guest spent quite a bit of time reporting on the mob during her nearly four-decade career as a reporter and columnist with the Las Vegas Review Journal. One of her biggest scoops came in 2008 when she was the first to report that Chicago mob associate Frank Lefty Rosenthal had been a government informant. Don't worry, we'll talk about it. Jane M. Morrison, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And so our audience just heard a clip of Frank Collada talking. And before we get into some other topics, I wanted to ask both of you, um, do you have any good stories about, about Frank that you'd like to share? I'm sorry. About, do you have any, do you have any, good, Frank? Do you have any good stories about Frank Collada? Yeah. When, when he first decided to uh, change sides, if you will, and uh, uh, become a government witness, uh, he was stashed for a little while in an underground uh, pistol range hmm. that the marshals used in the basement of the federal building. Um, <clears throat> uh, keeping there between other things that we were having him do. And I'd never met him. Uh, but I was taken down to meet him and the uh, marshal opened the uh, the door and of course there's nobody in there and they'd set up a cot for Frank in the back and it was very dark as if you turned off the lights and here and it being a shooting range it occurred to me to say bang and <laughs> Frank stood up from his cot and said that's not funny <laughs> that was our first exchange. <laughs> oh, I can picture that. My, my Frank's uh, Colada story is after he was out and was becoming uh, a public figure. You know, he's, he was no longer in hiding. He was no longer being sought by anything. He was not, no longer undercover. And th there was a panel somewhat like this, and I was on it. He was on it. A number of other people were on it. I think it was the first panel he had done, but it was at the uh, it was held at the Lorenzi Park, um, and I I remember going there thinking this is the first time. I wonder if he has enemies, 
Um, and so I ended up looking out at the audience to see if anybody was going to shoot us. <laughs> and I saw all these men in Hawaiian shirts. Well, you know a man in a Hawaiian shirt is an undercover agent packing. Mm -hmm. So I felt pretty safe there. Um, and uh, the, it would have been a better story if there had been gunfire, but there was none. It was Thank just goodness. a civilized conversation. Yeah. So Jane Ann, I wanted to ask, you were just starting out as a crime reporter during this time when, when it was just coming to light uh, how involved in various casinos the mob was in Las Vegas. When you were starting out as a crime reporter, did you expect the mob to be such a big part of your career? Well, I came here in 1976. Um, and in my, I was in my late, uh, when, when things started popping in 78, 79, uh, you know, big, big investigations were suddenly becoming in, uh, open. You know, the straw man uh, case in Kansas City, the uh, Argent case. Um, I was just a, a kid, basically, in my late 20s. And so I thought it was always going to be like this. I mean, it was the most exciting time of my life. And uh, I was meeting people like Frank Rosenthal and like Anthony Spilatro. And I, th I thought there would always be some people like that around in Las Vegas. I thought Las Vegas would stay that way, and it didn't, uh, which is the good news, but it, it changed. Sure. I'll ask you a question, Stan. Um, can you give us a sense of what your job was on the strike force? What, what did that entail? What was, the, what was the mission of that group, and what was your job within it? Well, uh, I wasn't there at the beginning, notwithstanding what Reed has said about the, his amazement that there are still people up to you and not around. <laughs> but the beginning was uh, 1961, when John Kennedy was elected president and appointed his brother Robert Attorney General. And they began setting up uh, what was then the strike force system. Now, the problem with the name is that it tends to conjure up people jumping out of airplanes with <laughs> machine guns. Right. It was actually 150 prosecutors spread out over 18 cities in the United States. Um, and the difference between those lawyers and all the other lawyers in the Department of Justice was that we were to focus completely on organized crime cases, no bank robberies, kidnappings, things like that, unless they had some connection with organized crime. And I started out in the Detroit office, and the second case I worked on was the assassination of Jimmy Hoffa. So I was a lot like Jane Ann, I thought, it is a pretty good job if this is what we're going to do. <laughs> you probably thought you were going to solve that case, too, at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and then 45 years later, right. we had a program courtesy of Mob Museum here about that. And there were still new theories coming out that night, 45 years after it happened. That's right. So, Jane Ann, you mentioned a couple of names, uh, Tony Spilatro, Frank Rosenthal. Um, you had a lot of run-ins with these folks back in the day. What was it like to just be, you know, out in public or doing your job or hanging out at a bar and, and running into guys who had mob connections? Well, you would see them, in my case, I would see them in the federal courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, I spent a fair amount of time with Tony Spilatro when he was doing hearings and they were arguing, his attorney, Oscar Goodman, was arguing, you know, to get things dismissed so it couldn't be presented as evidence in the trials. With Frank Rosenthal, he was, and he was very polite to me. Oh, you know, very polite. I was no threat to him. Tony Spilatro? Spilatro. I mean, I was no, I was no uh, Don Boyles of Arizona doing the investigative work, and I was no Ned Day 
running into him in bars and, you know, insulting him and saying, writing things like he's a man that walks like a spark plug or could be the other way around. Uh, either way, it's insulting. Um, and so, and so he was very nice to me. Um, his wife and I would chat in the hallways about our cats. I mean, you've got to talk about something. What, what else is she going to uh, say? And then with uh, Frank Rosenthal, I would run into him. Uh, well, the first time I ran into him was in a television interview show. And I'm the kind that writes my questions out. And uh, it, it was live television. And we were, I was going to ask him a question. And I looked up at him. And he looked at me with absolute hate. And that was my first encounter with him, so I didn't understand why he hated me so much. But I think it was a little just hostility towards the media and hostility towards women. Um, so I looked down and, and I had my question and I, and I uh, recovered, but it seemed like the longest 20 seconds of my life <laughs> um, and then I, I would run into him and I left I saw him coming out of the grand jury room one day and this is when he was wearing you know the hat that he refused to take off he wouldn't even take it off for the grand jury uh, because he'd had hair plugs put in mm -hmm. and uh, so he was coming out and I was gonna you know my job was to ask him what was going on in the grand jury what did he say and of course, I knew he wasn't going to tell me anything. But again, he looked at me like I was a worm and like he would like to step on me. And I tried to joke, and that was a mistake. Because uh, then, then he really wanted to step on me. But when I would run into him, it was I, was, I thought he was more frightening than Spalatra was, at least to me. Now, Spalatra supposedly murdered, uh, you know, 22 people, but he was never convicted of that. That was just what the feds thought that he did. Um, but anyway, the, it was it was uh, it was really nerve wracking to be with with yeah. um, Rosenthal. Mm -hmm. Stan, so your your job, part of your job anyway, was to review wiretap recordings, re to review the transcripts, and so forth, trying to find the right evidence. You have a favorite wiretap, I understand, from this period. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it, <clears throat> there were a lot. It, it comes under the heading of dark humor. <laughs> but uh, uh, sometimes what you're listening to, uh, it, it, at least sometime later, becomes funny, even if it isn't at the time. and. Uh, the gangsters uh, uh, always thought that they were being wiretapped because for them it was a status symbol, hmm. you know, because if the FBI is bothering to listen to my conversations, I must be important. So they would keep interrupting each other regularly to say, uh, um, I think my phone's tapped, or I hear a clicking noise, or something like that. And uh, we had a wiretap up on the phone that Spilatro was using, and the guy he was talking to did this usual, um, I hear clicking, I think my phone's tapped. And Spilatro said, it's the G standing for government. It's the G. They never sleep. And of course, you know, everybody involved on our side thought that was just great. We, you know, we didn't get that many compliments. <laughs> that was one. Very good. So before we let you go, we have a couple uh, uh, questions from our podcast listeners. Uh, Jeffrey C. wrote in with a question for Jane Ann. He was wondering if you could speak more about uh, your reporting on Lefty Rosenthal being a government informant, um, and specifically pointed out that uh, your sources were anonymous for that, anonymous government sources, 
Um, can you tell us about that story, how it came to be, and, and how it came to be reported so long after uh, Frank Rosenthal was in Las Vegas? Well, it's interesting. Uh, for pre preparing for tonight, I saw a story that I did in 95. And even in 95, it was speculated that he wasn't indicted, he wasn't charged. I mean, he, yes, he might have been uh, doing some grand jury stuff, but he was probably saying no comment. Um, and even in this, this story from 95, when I wrote about what's real and what's not real in the, in the uh, uh, movie Casino, even then, I have whole sections about how people thought he was an informant, mm. but they couldn't prove. You know, they couldn't prove it. Well, as soon as he died, um, you know, suddenly then I could get people who were knowledgeable to say, uh, yes, he he worked the government. I could never get them to say what he gave them if he gave them anything. I mean, he may have just been playing both sides. Uh, but it was an interesting, and I wasn't the only one that thought he was doing this. I mean, this was sort of in, uh, you know, bar talk among journalists and people like that. But once he was dead, I was able to get people to, to say it. And that was a big, a big story. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, you referenced a story that you wrote in 95. And our second question is actually uh, related to that. Bill S. Uh, had a question about the movie Casino. Uh, and he asked, having been around during this, the era in which the movie takes place, how accurate do you think the movie was, particularly in its portrayal of Frank Rosenthal, who of course was uh, played by Robert De Niro? Right. Well, I just happened to have found this today. <laughs> um, and, uh, oh yeah, I brought a prop. So this was a story I did in 95, uh, talking about what was real and what was, what was fiction. Uh, and it was a fun story to do because you got people to talk about it. About uh, Harry Reid said it was the worst time of his life, um, and uh, you know this this era. But Nick Pileggi, who wrote the book and the screenplay, he said it was about fifty percent fact and fifty percent fiction. I think it was more like seventy percent fact and 30% fiction um, because, and part of the fiction is you don't, you don't want to get sued by anybody still alive. Um, but I mean, the, 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 the story was really, came from two sources. It came from Frank Rosenthal himself and it came from Frank Salata, Frank Collada. So the Spilatro people um, ended up, Tony Spilatro ended up being the villain of the piece. Robert De Niro is playing the, the elegant uh, version of Rosenthal. And there's one scene in the movie where he gets up from behind his desk and he goes to the closet and he picks up, he gets his trousers and puts them on. He was known, that was true. I mean, okay. that some of the stuff that you didn't think might be true was true. And then other things, like a, a, an episode between uh, Nancy Spilatro and Jerry Rosenthal, uh, they softened that. Um, so, mm -hmm. so there were things that were moved around for, for theatrical purposes. And Stan, I assume you've seen the, the movie Casino as well? I, hope, I thought it was a great movie, but we've got... Uh, couple of great movies that have been done uh, about the Hoffa assassination, including one just a, a year or so ago, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> some great Las Vegas movies and great mob movies, but I don't think you want to try to stack them up and compare them with the truth. I mean, the point of making a movie is to sell tickets to the uh, movies. Uh, I, did, uh, I, I did think that, uh, I, I remember hearing back about the time Casino came out, uh, I remember thinking De Niro seems like a much nicer person than <laughs> Frank Rosenthal, to put it. <laughs> in plain English. Um, and I 
and then uh, I was told uh, that uh, Rosenthal got $250,000 to be a consultant on the movie. And suddenly it became very clear to me <laughs> why the De Niro character was so sympathetic. <laughs> yeah. I was always impressed and told people this, that that's the movie that really captured the look of Las yeah. Vegas at that yeah. time. And it was spot on. They, get the, they found places that really, really captured the look, the clothes, everything. There's even a couple scenes where they uh, make Kansas City look like Las Vegas. You know, they shot some of the Kansas City scenes here. Uh, well, thank, thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Um, for anyone watching who hasn't listened to Mobbed Up, you can hear a whole lot more from Stan and Jane Ann uh, on the podcast. Again, you can check out the podcast at reviewjournal.com slash mobbed up. Uh, our next guest is someone else who shared his story on that podcast. He is most well known as a longtime U.S. Senator from Nevada. Uh, but before he went to Congress, he spent four years as chairman of the Nevada Gaming Commission, and it was a highly eventful four years during which he fended off allegations of corruption, participated in an FBI sting operation, and famously squared off with the guy we've been talking about, Chicago mob associate Lefty Rosenthal, at licensing hearings. Uh, he wasn't able to join us live, but we're going to play an interview I conducted with former Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. Senator Harry Reid, I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join us uh, for this Mobbed Up live show and chat with me once again about the mob and your time on the Gaming Commission. Okay, thank you. So I know a lot of our listeners were fascinated by the stories you shared on the podcast uh, about your time with the Nevada Gaming Commission. And one of the things that I know I've been wondering since we last spoke is how your experience on the Gaming Commission uh, compared to what you expected going in, you know, were you expecting it to be such a tumultuous time, or did that come as a surprise? It really came as a surprise. I don't know, if surprise is the right word, but something I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. I can remember my predecessor, Pete Echeverria, very prominent lawyer from Reno, and O'Callaghan, the governor, and I met with him in his home in Reno his home, meaning Echeverria's home. And he started talking. I thought it was drivel. I mean, I thought, why is he talking this way? And he said, look right out that window. He said, there are people out there all the time watching me. They follow me around in my car. And I just thought that was so much BS. Mm. But it wasn't. Yeah. So, and so I'm, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. Um, one of the other things that you told me the last time that we spoke uh, was that you've actually made a point of never watching the movie Casino. Um, and obviously you're aware that there is a character in the movie that uh, was loosely based on you. But why have, why have you never uh, wanted to watch the movie or, or why do you never want to watch I've the movie? heard the movie made uh, the worst people ever existed on earth. Um, they made him look good. Um, he is somebody that was bad for Nevada, bad for gaming. Uh, he was a he was convicted felony of bribing basketball players. And you're, uh, you're speaking about Lefty Rosenthal. Yeah, Lefty Rosenthal, and he uh, well, he's he's probably the only person I've ever been physically afraid of because I knew he wouldn't. Uh, do anything personally, but he had people killed. I have had a friend, uh, he lived with one of the, uh, his, his friend was uh, dating one of Rosenthal's girlfriends, stepped out of his, their apartment, he, he got killed. Well, that's mm -hmm. why Greg Rosenthal, he was a killer, not himself, but he had it done. And the friend you're talking about, is that is that Gary Bates? Yes. So we actually had a, a question from one of our listeners, uh, Ryan S. He wrote in with a question about Gary Bates, um, who for any viewers who might not recognize that name, uh, was a former boxer um, and a friend of Sonny Liston's for a while, I believe, who provided your security for a long time. Um, and Ryan's question, I'll read it off here. Uh, he said, we know Gary Bates, the boxer, the blackjack dealer and security detail. 
Uh, but what is a memory or a story that you come back to when you think about Gary that defines his essence or his character? Gary Bates was so nice to my wife. He called her all the time, called her my little girl. Gary Bates was a big man. He'd been a boxer. It's very handsome, even though his nose was a little bent. Um, but he was, for me, uh, he was, uh, for example, Landry just got off the treadmill. I was out in, we had our home in Searchlight when I'd come back from Washington. And we were still based in Washington, but I had a home in Searchlight. So Gary Bates, I said, Gary, get me a treadmill. He said, you know, I'll get you the Cadillac. And he did, he found the most expensive one he could find. We still have it, we moved it over here. So that's Gary Bates with my friend. Mm -hmm. he, um, I never gave Gary Bates five cents, never. But I was his best man at several of his weddings. Um, he was married four or five times. The late, his last marriage his, had lasted. He married Carmen, and they were married quite a few years. They you know, got cancer and died. So that's my memory of Gary Bates. He just such a for Rolander, and for me, he was just the best. Just somebody that um, mm. good to me. All these years later, how do you reflect on your four years on the Nevada Gaming Commission uh, and the actions that, that you took and that other regulators took to, um, to get the mob out of the gaming industry in Las Vegas? Well, I had something to do with it. I thought that I really understood gaming. I had been in the assembly. I had been city attorney. I had been lieutenant governor. Um, I thought I knew it all. But obviously, I didn't. I did did not know that uh, the mob was so entrenched in what was going on in Las Vegas. And there are a number of reasons we were able to get rid of that. Not one person got it done. But let me mention a couple of people. First of all, a man by the name of Perry Thomas. Mm -hmm. Stadium, that's who he is. Um, he was a very handsome, movie star looking man. He was in Salt Lake. He was a banker. And he decided that he was going to have a bank in Las Vegas because he had he thought it was wrong that banks would not loan money to the gaming establishments. Mm -hmm. He started a bank down here. And that's that's the Bank of Las Vegas? No, no. I, was not, uh, I think it's Bank of Commerce to start with. Okay. Sure. Um, so he was instrumental. He's the one that went to Carson City during the legislature and sold the legislature in establishing corporate ownership of gaming. In the past, they would not allow corporations to own any of our gaming establishments. So he's the one that brought that about. Now, that is really significant. Mm -hmm. uh, the other person that should be mentioned is Grant Sawyer, who was the governor. And he was always um, in tune with what Harry Thomas was trying to do. And I think as a result of that, we came out with a much better operation. Gaming Control Board, Gaming Commission... Uh, it has worked out very well. Well, Senator Reed, thank you so much for, for joining us and for sharing some more of these stories. Appreciate your interest. Thanks again to Senator Reed for sitting down with me. For anyone watching who hasn't listened to the podcast yet, part six of the series goes into a lot more detail about his four years on the Gaming Commission, and it gets wild. Um, before we introduce our second and final panel for the evening. We're gonna do one more trivia question, give away one more of these lovely prize baskets. As a reminder, uh, please check your direct messages on Facebook. Our team will be reaching out if you are our, one of our two lucky winners. Um, if you don't respond to our message within five minutes, we'll have to look for someone else, so just check your messages and, uh, and they'll be reaching out. Uh, so our second trivia question, the only felony conviction on Tony Spilatro's record at the time of his death was for cheating on a home loan application. What was his penalty? You'll have three options. A, five years in prison. 
B, a $1 fine, or C, time served plus one night in prison. A, five years in prison, B, a $1 fine, or C, time served plus one night in prison. Again, type your answers into the comment section on Facebook. Our team will be reaching out by direct message, so check for that. And we will announce our winners after this next panel. Let's get to that panel. Uh, the first of our next panelists is over here to my left, Michael Green, a historian and associate professor of history at UNLV. He's written a whole bunch of books about uh, the history of Nevada, most recently, Nevada, a history of the Silver State. He's also one of the board members here at the Ma Museum. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Thanks for having me. Also with us is Jeff Silver, who is a former member of the Nevada Gaming Control Board and a strip hotel casino executive. Uh, he also happens to be chair of the Ma Museum Board of Directors. Welcome back, Jeff. Thank you. My pleasure. And first, I want to thank, thank Reed for what I consider to be a wonderful podcast series. I, I enjoyed every minute of it, and it was so compelling, so truthful, so uh, accurate about what was going on at the time. I thought uh, you did a, an excellent job and certainly are deserving of great praise. I, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you being a part of it and, and, as, and joining us for this. And as I like to say in board meetings with him, I'll second the motion. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that as well. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. So we've been talking a lot about the 70s and 80s in Las Vegas, the, the casino era, if we're going to put it in terms of movies, as opposed to the Bugsy era or whatever else, um, or the, the corny rom-coms of the 2000s. Uh, but of course, the mob was here long before the 70s and 80s. Can you give us sort of a quick overview of the early history of organized crime in Nevada and in Las Vegas? Well, you can find a lot of different forms of it. And there was some going on in Reno as well in the old days. But Gambling becomes legal in Nevada in 1931. Even before that, there are a couple of operators around here. One was named Jim Ferguson. And I'll send you to the Mob Museum website. One of our board members, Bob Stolold, did a wonderful series on Ferguson's involvement here. But when we get into things in the 30s, the Cornero brothers come here from California. They were involved in all kinds of prohibition activities over there that were yeah, illegal. And you get guys who are coming in, and they're, they're in small operations, small casinos. There isn't that much happening until you get into the World War II era, and then you begin to see people tied to Meyer Lansky, where we now know they're tied, but even then there were plenty of suspicions. And they end up getting involved in the El Cortez. They also get involved in race wires. It was very important to be involved in that, because then you had all the odds makers around the country, you had all the races and the betting going on, and that's actually what brought Bugsy Siegel here, to be involved in the race wire. And then he goes into the casino business. So by the time Siegel opens the Flamingo in December of 46, there are already a few others around here, uh, different cities and so on. And then as the strip develops in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, what you get are people from different parts of the country. You, you get a sort of New York group, but you have Gus Greenbaum out of Phoenix. Ben Gofstein was involved up in Albany, New York. You get the Mayfield Road Gang out of Cleveland. Uh, there are people coming in from Kentucky, Chicago. And so you, this becomes sort of a central location for organized crime interests because here they could legally operate a casino. Uh, there's an old line that Benny Binion had that really applies. He was asked, why'd you leave Dallas for Las Vegas? And he said, my sheriff got beat. <laughs> well, he didn't have to worry about that here. Uh, the sheriff was fully expecting you to run a casino here. <laughs> Jeff, we, we saw in the, it was back to the 1970s and 80s, uh, we saw in the 70s the emergence of state gaming regulators as, as a force to be reckoned with. And, and you were among those to be reckoned with. Um, can you explain kind of how and, and why this occurred at that time? The original uh, concern was that the feds were going to find a way to make gambling illegal. Nevada was the only state that hadn't legalized gambling. And uh, essentially, this was the development over the years from John F. Kennedy uh, and Bobby Kennedy's uh, attack on organized crime. The fact that in this particular room, we had hearings that, the, that uh, Senator Kefauver was holding uh, about the race wire. And uh, uh, so it was a, a development that if we, if we would not clean up our own house, 
then the feds were going to find a way to tax us out of existence or find other reasons why gambling was going to be made illegal in the state. And of course, it was the state's major economy, still is today. And uh, that was something that I think that the regulators took to heart. The first Gaming Control Board after the Gaming Control Act was passed in 1959, the appointment by the governor was, uh, Grant Sawyer, was to put former FBI agents on as members of the board. So they were trying to demonstrate to the federal government that, there, that we had the ability to clean up our own act. And that was a continuing uh, theme throughout. It had uh, a lot of people that were uh, moving against it because uh, organized crime had been so ingrained in our society. And that's the reason why we had the Federal Strike Force and Stan Hunterton here uh, and those people because the feds thought that if you stayed here long enough as an FBI agent uh, or as a U.S. attorney, somehow you would be tainted by the, uh, the culture of Las Vegas being a criminal culture. And therefore, we had to bring in people from out of town in order to make sure that, uh, that uh, justice was being uh, meted out uh, correctly. And uh, the strike force and Stan and, and the people that came in there, I was investigated by a guy named Dick Crane, uh, by the governor of the state of Nevada before he appointed me, Michael Callahan, just to make sure that somebody from the outside took a look at me and my background before putting me in a position where I was uh, charged with the, uh, the cleanup of organized crime. So one of the things that I find particularly fascinating about the mob in Las Vegas as opposed to other cities is that different mob families would actually cross invest and end up working together instead of competing for territory or for, um, for different casinos. And I've talked to both of you about this, so I'll throw it out there for either of you to answer, but how did that come to be and, and what are some examples of, of a situation where you had different mob families from around the country working together? Well, I mean, I can give you all kinds of stories about uh, investigations that we did. For example, uh, the St. Louis mob uh, and the Detroit people had the Aladdin Hotel and uh, when the Aladdin was uh, running out of money because they, they siphoned too much off of the establishment, Moore Schenker, who was with the Dunes in the St. Louis side with uh, Jimmy Hoffa, uh, he would go over to the Aladdin and play blackjack and purposefully lose enough money to, get, to put money back into the cage so that they can meet their payrolls and, and things of that nature. Uh, we had people packing up valises with $100 bills and, you know, we're heading off to different cities to pay the tribute to the various organized crime people that had partnered up in these various casinos. And these are things that we uh, determined uh, were occurring as a result of, of uh, FBI wiretaps. When I, when I was first appointed on the board my first week or two there, um, the FBI, I think, wanted to test me. I was 29 years old and I didn't really have a, a background as to all the things that were going on, although I grew up in Las Vegas. Uh, but they asked me to uh, go into the Dunes Hotel and see if I could get information from them for them for a, a search warrant. So what I did was I walked into the cage and I showed my badge to the, the guy that was in charge of the cage and I said, I'd like to see your file box with all the names of the safe deposit boxes that you have for your customers there. And, you know, they objected to it, but, I, you know, as a gaming agent, I had the ability to get any kind of information I, I wanted. And uh, so I did find out which box belonged to which person. I told the FBI which, what it was. They put it on a, a uh, search warrant, came in, drilled the boxes, and got like $800,000 in cash from these people that was uh, ill-gotten gains. So that was all tested in the, in the federal courts because they tried to suppress that information. But... Uh, that cemented me and my relationship with the FBI for my four years there. They knew I, I would be uh, trustworthy and, and helpful in, in the job of trying to get rid of organized crime. Sure. Well, what you find is that they were coming in here, in essence, paying some tribute to Lansky, apparently. Uh, there, there was the joke I heard from somebody who once said, you know, one, one for me, one for the government, one for Meyer. <laughs> and you also had respect between them, at least in the earlier group. Mo Dalitz was, in a lot of ways, the leader. Now, Robbins Cahill, who was one of Jeff Silver's predecessors at the control board, I think he used the term silk glove man. Guys like Dalitz might have been tough in their youth, but they're businessmen. And being businessmen, they understand this is our golden goose. 
we're not going to kill it. And that includes competition. They're competing for the dollar, but they're also united. There, there are politicians they like, there are issues they're together on, there, there are organizations they get together to help. And I think that the cutthroat part of it uh, tended to involve when uh, people got in their way, but in terms of among themselves, not so much of that. So there was a lot of cooperation. And then later we get into the casino era, we'll call that for the movie, and we've got Chicago, Kansas City, and Milwaukee, and there's the story where Nick Savella uh, finds out from Alan Glick that uh, Frank Balistrieri in Milwaukee isn't doing what he thought he was. And now they're upset with each other. <laughs> Uh, so it's a different generation in a sense, even if you know, this group that we're talking about, like Savella, are in the same age group, but it's a different generation in Las Vegas's gaming history. Mm -hmm. Jeff, uh, so the effort to push the mob out of Las Vegas involved a lot of different entities and individuals, uh, but a really important contributor to this was uh, a journalist, Ned Day. Um, can you explain who Ned Day was and why he was so significant in your mind? Ned Day was uh, a man of his own. I mean, he uh, didn't answer to any other person but himself. And uh, he came here as a journalist and saw that there was organized crime here and thought, this is going to be my ticket to, uh, to fame. I'm going to go after and find out who these people are and assist those people in the government who are trying to get rid of them. And I'm going to shine this light on them. I and it's not going to be just a little pen light. It's going to be a full-blown searchlight. And he had uh, first started with a, a newspaper called the Valley Times. And that didn't have a lot of circulation, although for the inside group, they all read it because there was some uh, information there that they couldn't get from more traditional sources. And then he moved from there to the Las Vegas Review Journal and then to uh, KLAS-TV, the CBS affiliate. And all throughout the time that he was there, he was tat, 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 tat. He was shining the light on the likes of Spalatro. He, I believe, penned the name Tony the Ant. And uh, he was uh, calling these people out. And he created, he made them media celebrities. And that was the one thing that the people in Chicago, Milwaukee, Kansas City did not want. They did not want their theft machine to be disturbed by someone who was shining the light on them and saying how bad these people were because this, the society of Las Vegas had, had more or less come accustomed to organized crime people and tolerated them and didn't think about them as being loan sharks, burglars, bad people, murderers. And... Uh, when, when uh, he started doing those things, he created an interest from other reporters, Jane Ann, uh, Gwen Castaldi, George Knapp, some of the other people that people in Las Vegas know about. And they started focusing on organized crime. And the end result was is that when Rosenthal was denied his license, he didn't have the same kind of platform that he would have had if it had been just me or the members of the Gaming Control Board or Harry Reid in the commission. He was also getting information about himself, about his ego, and about all the other things that uh, were going on in the city that were contrary to the best interests of Las Vegas. That was all being published by guys like Ned Day. And Ned Day in particular, he started chasing down some of the people that were accused of the Stardust slot scam, the $7 million mm -hmm. scam that uh, they, they took money from the, from the, the Argent Corporation properties. Uh, by substituting underweighing coin and substituting that for cash, and, and that was disappearing. Everyone was accusing uh, Jay Vandermark of that, <clears throat> the slot guy, but it was really money going, it was going directly back to Chicago, and Vandermark was not to be seen since. I know that Ned Day came into my office and asked for 500 bucks to go down to Mexico to go looking for Jay Vandermark because he had some information on leads that he was going to be there, and I gave him the money. And... Uh, I think he got pretty close, but he never did find Jay, Jay Vandermark. But he was, it, was, it was Ned <clears throat> that created that bravery in the journalistic uh, profession that uh, I think was the beginning of the end for organized crime because he's the one that focused on what was right and, and did the right thing in terms of telling the public about it. So before we let you go, we have a couple questions from podcast listeners. Uh, 
The first from Eric R. who asks, were there any big name casinos the mob wasn't involved in? And let's, let's assume pre-1990s, of course. <laughs> well, I used to say that the gaming was, after we were done, was 99 and 44, 100% pure, but with uh, 1,600 licensees, that still left room for quite a few that were pretty bad. Um, but I would have to say that, you know, the, the, after Howard Hughes came in, uh, that, that changed the uh, landscape quite a bit. Uh, because now we were looking at corporate America, we were looking at uh, uh, people who, uh, who came in and had uh, backgrounds in, in FBI that, uh, that, that were helping Howard Hughes with his properties. You didn't have the same kind of people that were running these casinos because now you had accountants that came in and, and changed the whole culture of the gaming industry itself. And I think with that, I, I, I would have to say that there were quite a few that uh, did not have organized crime connections, but we all know who the real bad ones were. I mean, they were the ones that ultimately turned out to be uh, parts of indictments, the Tropicana, the Aladdin, the Dunes, the, uh, the Argent properties. Uh, and those those all, all were part and parcel of the ones that were discovered in the Kansas City tapes. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I assume you would add Kirk Kikorian probably to that list as well. Oh, Kirk Kikorian, I think, yeah. was, uh, was, was one of the square shooters. Uh, uh, I'm sorry I didn't mention him. He was really a, a legend in terms of, of uh, showing how it could be done uh, the right way. And our second question, uh, we actually got a few questions that'll sort of merge into one. Uh, they were all about the mob landscape in the U.S. today. Uh, from Ashley B., Barbara M., and Matt E., um, I'll ask specifically about Las Vegas. Is the mob out of Las Vegas? And if the traditional mafia is out, what does organized crime look like in Vegas today? Well, in terms of running the casinos, I think it's safe to say they're out. And this has to do with corporations and what Jeff Silver was saying. There's also a whole different set of regulations that they have to deal with. And my joke over the years has been, you know they're not around because there are no 99-cent steak dinners. <laughs> that, that's just the way things are now. But where you'll find organized crime, it, it's always around. And it's certainly around here. And you'll find it on the streets. You'll find it involved in drugs or prostitution. The things that, frankly, traditional organized crime was involved in, if you just separated it from Las Vegas, where they had the casinos as well. Illegal casinos, I mean, there, there's illegal gambling around the country. We know that. They're going to be involved in that. So they're still out there. But in terms of running Las Vegas casinos the way they did, that has changed. Well, my big thanks to both of you for, for joining us, and thanks again to all of our other guests throughout the live stream, Senator Harry Reid, Jane Ann Morrison, and Stan Hunterton. If you want to hear more from all of our panelists and you haven't already listened, I'll encourage you one more time, go check out <laughs> Mobbed Up, The Fight for Las Vegas. Just search for Mobbed Up on any podcast app, or if you don't listen to podcasts and have no idea what I'm talking about, you can head to reviewjournal.com slash mobbed up. Uh, there's a link in the description of this live stream that you can click to head there. You can listen to all 11 episodes right now. Uh, and if you want to uh, learn more about the mob, of course, the place to do it is here at the Mob Museum. Jeff, what else is coming up here at the museum? Well, thank you for, for offering me the chance to talk about that. You know, we had a bit of a slowdown uh, recently, but we are back to a robust programming calendar, and uh, we're kicking off uh, August with a program with Michael Green. He's going to talk about, uh, go back to the 1960s and talk about JFK and RFK and the, uh, and the mob in Las Vegas. And so I think that's going to be very interesting. And then in uh, uh, September 16th, we'll have another local historian, David Schwartz, talking about the Sands Hotel. He's got a new book all about the Sands, and that will be coming out this fall. Promises to be uh, a really entertaining event. And of course, David Schwartz was also featured on the podcast. That's so right. I'll be looking forward to both of those. And before we say goodbye, as promised, I will give you the answers to our trivia questions and announce the winners. The first question was, again, where did we take you on our pre-show tour of the museum aside from this courtroom? Your options were the distillery, the crime lab, open city, or the speakeasy. And the answer is C, the open city exhibit. And our second trivia question, 
was what was Tony Spilatro's penalty for the only felony conviction on his record at the time of his death, uh, which was lying on a home loan application. The options were A, five years in prison, B, a $1 fine, or C, time served plus one night in prison. And your answer was B, $1. And our producer, Aaron, has the names of our winners, I believe. All right, so two people who will be both taking home a uh, prize basket. Our first trivia winner was Deborah Artal. Excuse me if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. And our second trivia winner was Monica Florence. So Deborah Artal and Monica Florence, enjoy your mobbed up slash mob museum prize baskets. <laughs> I'm a little jealous myself. And with that, we have reached the end of our mobbed up live program. Thank you so much for tuning into the podcast, for tuning into this live stream. And we hope you have a great night. Thank you.